Welcome to You Are From God, where we open the Bible and learn to see the image of God in ourselves and the people around us. I'm Scott Taylor. And I'm Tyler Hall. Thanks for joining us today. Today, Scott, we are going to talk about the idea of having a faith that is always on. We talk here at West Mason sometimes about the idea of putting our faith on a dimmer switch. You know, Jesus will teach that you're the light of the world, that your city set on the hill. But sometimes we'll act like, you know, I'll be more on as far as the light and shining than other times, whether it's necessarily acting that way around other people or even facing things in my own personal life. The idea that Jesus doesn't want us just every once in a while or on one day a week or a couple days a week. Even 99%, that's pretty good. That's a passing grade as far as school goes, but Jesus always wants 100% of our lives. And so today we want to focus on what it means to walk with God every moment of every day to have this not just hobby sort of Christianity, but a true daily Christianity that the Bible actually teaches and, and talks about. It's sort of like in Colossians 3 where we talked about him being our life and really what that looks like. Any relationship that we have, we can understand this. If we're not spending the time we need to with our spouse, there's going to be issues. If we're not doing the same with our children, there's going to be issues that we that we have. And, and so it comes, obviously, it's the same when it comes to our God. God, however, is going to do his part always. It's whether or not we're going to do ours. And there's so many passages in the scriptures, Tyler, that talk about this idea of keeping our focus on God, always viewing him, seeing him. And, and one of those that um, I think of is in John, Joshua, the third chapter, where Joshua is they just crossed over the Jordan. They're going to cross over the Jordan. And, and after they get over there, he's going to tell them, look, this is the way I want you to camp. You need to make sure that the ark is in the middle and you're focusing on the ark and and when you see it get up and go, then you need to go up, get up and go. So there's, it was the following of, of the Ark of the Covenant. So in verse 4 of Joshua 3, it says, However, there shall be between you and at a distance of about 2,000 cubits by measure. Do not come near it, that you may know the way by which you shall go, for you have not passed this way before. So even common sense will tell you, obviously, they're going into an area they've never been before. And it's going to be pretty easy to get lost if you're not paying attention to where you are. And so just from the perspective of the Ark of the Covenant and them knowing where that is at all times, there's other reasons. There's obviously the holiness piece of this that plays into it as well. But it's also a marker. It's the standard. And so for us, it's the same. It's it's the danger for us. Stop looking at God or stop looking through our prism with God into the world and getting lost in the world. And that can happen so quickly if we're not careful. And that's really what starts a lot of the issues that we deal with in this life. That's the danger when we take our focus off of God and put it on anything else, whether it's bad or even if it's good. Yeah, it's amazing how he phrases it as he's instructing Joshua and the people. You have not passed this way before. I mean, that's life as much as we'd like to deny that, that, OK, I kind of know what I'm doing here or I've got a good sense of how to tackle this new problem or new challenge or new season of life. Look, you're by nature as much self-help books that you might read or. Um, other people's counsel that you get, you yourself have not, you know, maybe been a teenager before. You haven't gone off to college before. You haven't worked in this field before. You haven't had to face this kind of challenge to your faith before, whatever situation that you, listener, might even be facing right now. And so we need to heed what God's saying here. You know, you haven't passed this way before. How do you navigate the, the ways of life? Well, it's about following God's ways. And again, for Joshua and them, it was literally following the Ark of the Covenant and how it was being led. For us, it means about following Jesus. He teaches this, Jesus does, in John chapter 15, or this amazing passage. This is right before he's about to go out into the garden and be betrayed. John spends a lot of time talking about the things that he shared with his disciples in that upper room before they left. John 15 are some beautiful passages that might sound familiar to you. I'm going to read the first 11 verses for you this morning out of the English Standard Version. John 15, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit he takes away, and every branch that does bear fruit he prunes, that it may, be, that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. 
For apart from me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers, and the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. There's so many awesome pieces to this, Scott. Mm. Obviously, the theme, if you go through and count, is this word abide, which shows up at 10 times in these 11 verses. So clearly, Jesus is trying to press a certain call to action here, and it's simply to abide. Now, when I hear that word, and maybe when you hear that word, I get this idea of home. We sometimes will use the word abode as the place where we dwell, this place where we call our home base, the we go back to at the end of every adventure, expedition, or outing. We come back, and this is our abode. Well, God is meant to be our home. The teachings of Jesus, his commandments, his love, he says, abide in my Love, this is what home looks like. Even if you don't have a place to lay your head, you can always rest and find energy and strength and have a base of operation, so to speak, in the love of Christ and understanding that that comes, as he says in verse 10, with following God's commandments and following the teachings of Jesus. But Scott, I'll tell you, abiding sounds like a very simple thing to do, but it's a real challenge for a lot of us. And I think that's why Jesus actually takes the time to instruct his apostles to do this, and by extension, that they will instruct us to do the same. It's interesting, if you continue on here, that he'll talk about how you treat one another and how you go live in the world. Mm -hmm. And that's really what we're talking about, is you have this relationship with the, the vine, uh, and and the re- the attitude that we need to have with our relationship with God and, and putting that first and abiding in him. And it's going to be seen in our relationship with others. It's going to be seen in our relationship with the world. The interesting thing to me, Tyler, is verse 11 when he talks about if you're abiding correctly, if you're doing the things that you need to do, it's going to bring joy because joy comes when you have a close relationship with God. It comes with that attitude. It doesn't mean, as we've talked about so often, it certainly does not mean that you're not going to have issues. Matter of fact, you will have issues, mainly because it's life. That's what you're going to have. And also because you're following God and not everybody is happy about that Mm -hmm. thing. But you get to choose joy. You get to choose how you react to something. Uh, that you're going through. And and the reality is it's a lot easier to go through it when you're going through it with the creator of all things and our father, you know, the one that's going to take care of us. And it reminds me so much of uh, Philippians, the fourth chapter, Tyler. And it's interesting to me when we talk about meditation today, which I think is a good thing. I think it's important for us to kind of slow down. uh, I was going to say every once in a while, but often Mm -hmm. Our, our lives are just so busy. And you know, for me, I, when we have some silence and time in our lives, it's amazing how often we try to fill that with uh, a podcast or we try to fill that, which you should with it, this one, <laughs> but we, we try to fill that time with, with something just because we need the noise, not necessarily because we're trying to listen to something or it almost just becomes white noise so often. When the reality is we can actually take time to just be silent before God, be in his presence and, and in essence, feel that presence, understanding that he's there with us. And Philippians, the fourth chapter, I think, tells us um, how to do that. The The reality is he tells us we need to rejoice in verse four. Make sure that we're treating other people with a gentle spirit. Let people know that we have a gentle spirit. Be- why? Because the Lord's near. We're, we're with him. Be anxious for nothing is a verse that we'll talk about a lot in verse six. But in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Well, that sounds fantastic. But how do you do that? Mm-hmm. That's what verse 8, I think, comes in, so is so important. Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there is any excellence and anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things. The word dwell here or mm-hmm. ponder is also the word meditate. It's this perspective of the world may tell you to meditate and just to clear your mind, which is fine. The biblical the way of meditation, though, is that you feel that space now with God's word you continue to fill that space with God's word it's it's that relationship aspect that you have with him and his word and if we're doing those things then we're able to get through this busy life and it is but we're able to do it with our eyes solely focused on God and focused on what he wants us to do and we're able to go through this world with joy again it doesn't mean that we're not going to have issues but it does mean we're going to have the peace of God 
And that's what we're all striving to have in our daily day to day lives uh, of serving Christ. And I think, you know, we use these different words, you know, the teaching of the scriptures that we looked at is abide, um, dwelling here, that idea, the, a popular term that you brought up is meditation or to meditate. You certainly see that in the Old Testament as well, that the words in my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you, Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Those are beautiful words. What does it look like practically? I mean, do I need to go grab a nice comfy pillow to sit cross-legged on the floor and hold my hands out and close my eyes and to like take deep breaths? Look, some of those things can certainly help. Uh, but practically speaking, you know, you can dwell on God, meditate on his word in the midst of a busy subway car and in the middle of the busy day at work and while the kids are running around or while you're running to and fro with errands or door dashing or whatever is going on. There's always an opportunity to dwell. I think sometimes we we look at this idea of taking God's word into us and there has to be this sort of mysticism behind it, which is which is not the case. It's this idea that we have this opportunity to truly dwell on God's word and in that it's an active dwelling. It's about truly embracing what we have in this relationship and living by it. That's what Jesus says. Keep my commandments. Abiding in his love doesn't just look like, oh, I'm going to just rest and (laughs) not do anything. Abiding in his love is about having confidence to say, all right, I'm going to do the things I know that Jesus has taught me and do them with confidence. That doesn't mean that I can't grow, that I shouldn't grow, that there's things for me to learn, and I certainly grow into that. But that's where abiding comes in, because I am going back to the word and taking it in regularly. You know, Scott, we looked at the Gospel of John, but John will write these other shorter epistles towards the end of most Bibles. And uh, in First John, as an example, he again brings up this idea of abiding. It's this phrase that he'll often teach on, obviously inspired by God's Spirit. At the end of the second chapter of First John, In verse 28, he'll say, And now, little children, abide in him, so that when he appears, we may have confidence and not shrink from him in shame at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you may be sure that everyone who practices righteousness has been born of him. Just the amazing confidence that John writes here, that you can be sure that if you're practicing the righteousness that Jesus teaches, the righteousness that his apostles teach and that he teaches in the New Testament, we have this confidence that we're born of him, we're his children, and that's These awesome verses that start chapter 3 will continue. See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God. And so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we, we shall be like him, because we shall see him as he is. And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. You look at this abiding aspect, and it's really about understanding the end that's coming, the great hope of being with him forever. What what we will be has not yet appeared. We're not going to shrink in shame at his coming because we have this confident because we're his children. It's dad coming home to get us, to take us home. It's all these awesome ideas that we can get to of understanding what it truly means to abide. And it's to the point you're making, Bill, being practical in this, in the application of this. Verse uh, 13 through 16, really, of 1 John 3, you get the other side. If if you're going to abide in Jesus, there's going to be certain things that people are going to see. There's going to be certain things that you're going to do. You can say it. Well, he goes on in, in verse 15 of uh, 1 John, the third chapter. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. You cannot be, and this is really the point of this whole chapter, you cannot be practicing sin. You cannot be doing the things of this world and on a constant basis abiding in it, as was the meaning, and expect that you have a relationship with God. You can't. And so that's really what this comes down to. If we're going to make the application to ourselves and make sure that we're truly living a daily life for Jesus Christ, it's found where really it comes down to where are we abiding? Yeah, that choice that we make every day and that you have the choice listener to make today. Maybe you haven't been abiding in Jesus or his love and keeping his commandments. Uh, And maybe you have, and it's challenging to really focus and keep your eyes fixed on the things that are important. We encourage you today to really see yourself as Jesus describes his children, as those who are branches that come from the vine, that draw their strength from the vine, that produce fruit, that good works, because they are drawing that strength, that energy from the vine. And that's where we need to dwell and meditate 
and every step of every day just going back to this constant appreciation and living the fact that each and every one of us is from God. Thanks for listening. Show your support by leaving a review on your podcast app and share this episode with someone you want to encourage. If you have questions or would like to get in touch with us, go to youarefromgod.com. That's youarefromgod.com.